The colon, I think I'd, I'd like to use just for fun, um, which I've never seen anywhere except in, um, I think it was in Daitokaji in Kyoto, where you're wandering through the rooms and suddenly the whole world is in a teacup. There's a sign there for you. So. <laughs> Helpful, very helpful. <laughs> and so, <laughs> helpful. So the whole world is in a teacup. Something to be said for that. The whole world is in a teacup. There's a great Indian myth that's sort of the same, really, that says uh, Krishna's a little baby and sort of, you know, just getting in trouble the way little babies do and and... And his mother can see he's got something in his mouth. And so she says, open up. Oh, she doesn't want him to swallow it. Open up. And she finally pries his mouth open. And there's a galaxy in there. <laughs> so it's like the whole world is in a teacup. It's your world. So I've been thinking about uh, surprise. And how, in some way, it unmakes the, when we get surprised, it unmakes whatever we've made in our minds, you know. Uh, whatever we've made to be comfortable, and that's kind of usually a good thing. You know, it took me a while to realize that was usually a good thing. And um, in fact, I, in a way, I remember as a child, uh, by the age of about six, working out where my parents must be keeping the Christmas presents in uh, early December. And uh, I'm starting to open them to see what I had and then realizing some stage halfway through that, that just wasn't a good idea. <laughs> I let it, had to let life come to me. You know, It was a nice thing to realize, actually. It seemed, felt like very... <clears throat> hard to do, but it, I, I could tell it was true. Maybe I was seven or something, but anyway, whatever I was. I was kind of young, and uh, and it was a small house, so it wasn't wasn't rocket science to work out the only place they could have hit the, the, only, the presents. You know? <laughs> but, uh, but it's a nice thing to know that to let the world come to you, to let the gift of the world appear in your heart and and uh, like that, you know. Um, and so I, and how much a surprise, sometimes a surprise when it's terrible is nonetheless very interesting. <coughs> Many years ago, um, 15, 16, 18 years ago or something, I remember getting a cancer diagnosis, and I wasn't really expecting it. I mean, uh, but the physician called me in, and I thought, oh, shit. You know? And um, uh, and then the room was sort of very plain, sort of was one of those boring sort of physician rooms that's designed to kind of be boring in a way, <laughs> and, uh, and not to allow the psyche to spread out or people to enjoy each other. But nonetheless, in this completely boring room, sterile and stark, suddenly everything spread out and it was tremendously warm. I felt a tremendous appreciation for everyone in my life, including the physician who's giving me the news. And I had no idea what it meant or something. He looked kind of solemn and like <laughs> it was something to take into account and later on I had surgery and a friend's pl a friend's hospital and things like that but a hospital where a friend worked and things so it all kind of worked out okay the way things are, that's what life does it kind of works out okay not that okay not completely okay because we don't know what that is but it works out okay because we're here because we show up for it and that's okay I want to read, and so surprise is it's one of those things. Um, I carefully have some nice things printed out to read to you, which I may have jumbled. Ah, here we are. Um, uh, this is long ago, but it's an interesting account. Uh, 
Kessler was a, I think, Hungarian journalist and intellectual um, in the time of the Spanish Civil War, and he was captured uh, because he was uh, he was actually a journalist, but he was also a spy for the. He was captured by the fascist forces because they correctly believed he was a spy. <laughs> so, uh, who, who me? Yeah. And um, uh, and uh, he was sentenced to death and placed in a cell to be killed, executed in the morning. But and uh, I must have stood there for some minutes, in, and then suddenly, in these circumstances, in this death cell, as the night went on something happened to his mind. I must have stood there for some minutes entranced with a wordless awareness that this is perfect, perfect. Then I was floating on my back in a river of peace and the bridges of silence. It came from nowhere and flowed nowhere. Then there was no river and no eye. I, the eye had ceased to exist. When I say the eye had ceased to exist, I refer to a concrete experience as verbally as incommunicable as the feeling aroused by a piano concerto, yet just as real, only much more real. In fact, its primary mark is the sensation that this state is more real than any that has been experienced before. So uh, I guess what he's describing is really showing up for things. You know, <laughs> and the shock of thinking I'm going to die, all the things we put in our mind and all the little steps we're taking and the list I have of what I'm going to do after the meditation and, you know, I wonder how long it's going to take and, well, maybe in this meditation I can do better than I did in the last one. All that stuff disappears. Um, I wonder if I can stop the kids fighting at Christmas. All that stuff disappears. And uh, I wonder if my child will finally understand that I love them rather than thinking I'm, you know, <laughs> there's something worthy of complaint in a relationship. All that stuff just disappears and here we are. So that's meditation. and You don't actually have to be put in a death cell in, in Spain uh, many years ago, but it's sort of beautiful in a way. And, and here's the, and so... Uh, the kind of a, it's an epiphany kind of thing, I guess. What James Joyce called it, the whatness of things. And James Joyce was a person who, uh, you know, people either adore or don't like very much as a writer. <laughs> but his understanding that when we really just see into reality, something profound is happening and it can be any part of reality and that, that's the whole of Zen really any part of reality chopping wood carrying water the old saying but you know doing your taxes whatever it is so I'm going to read you uh, the famous poem about surprise it's Elizabeth Bishop it's called the fish I caught a tremendous fish and held him beside the boat half out of water with my hook fast in a corner of his mouth. He didn't fight. He hadn't fought at all. He hung a grunting weight, battered and venerable and homely. Here and there his brown skin hung in strips like ancient wallpaper. And its pattern of darker brown was like wallpaper. Shapes like full-blown roses stained and lost through age. He was speckled with barnacles, fine rosettes of lime, and infested with tiny white sea lice, and underneath two or three rags of green underneath two or three rags of green weed hung down. While his gills were breathing in the terrible oxygen, the frightening gills fresh and crisp with blood that can cut so badly. I thought of the coarse white flesh packed in like feathers, the big bones and the little bones, the dramatic reds and blacks of his shiny entrails, and the pink swim bladder like a big peony. I looked into his eyes, which were far larger than mine, but shallower and yellowed, 
The iris is backed and packed with tarnished tinfoil seen through the lenses of old scratched isinglass. They shifted a little, but not to return my stare. It was more like the tipping of an object towards the light. I admired his sullen face, the mechanism of his jaw, and then I saw that from his lower lip, if you could call it a lip, grim, wet and weapon-like, hung five old pieces of fish line, or four and a wire leader with a swivel still attached. At <coughs> grown fir and with all their five big hooks grown firmly in his mouth. A green line frayed at the end where he broke it, two heavier lines and a fine black thread still crimped from the strain and snap when it broke and he got away. Like meadows with their ribbons frayed and wavering, a five-haired beard of wisdom trailing from his aching jaw. I stared and stared, and victory filled up the little rented boat. <clears throat> Where oil, uh, and victory filled up the little rented boat from the pool of bilge where oil had spread a rainbow round the rusted engine to the baler rusted orange, the sun-cracked thwarts, the oarlocks on their strings, the gunnels, till everything was rainbow, 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 and I let the fish go. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> I read an interview with her somewhere, maybe it was Paris Review, and she said, God, everybody always asks me to read the fish. <laughs> but she liked someone else that... Um, uh, she reported being at a writer's conference where um, people were blathering on in a way that she wasn't actually, in spite of being a writer, she wasn't a blatherer on her. And, um, and, uh, and she said the person she was really waiting to see, wanting to see was William Stafford. And uh, who was in a very, and William Stafford is the guy who s said to his students, just write a poem every day. And they said, that's impossible. I couldn't possibly, I couldn't possibly do that. He said, I didn't say a good poem. <laughs> he said, lower your standards. There's something like that about Zen. Do your meditation every day. But I'm not doing it very well. Excellent. <laughs> do that. So I'm not showing up for the moment very well. That's how you're showing up for the moment. So here's Stafford. Uh, Michael Wilding sort of sent this out a little while ago, read it in our morning temple, so I decided to pirate it. You reading, it's a little preachy for Stafford, but you know, he kind of gets away with it in my view. You reaching this, be ready. Starting here, what do you want to remember? How sunlight creeps along a shining floor? What scent of old wood hovers? What softened sound from outside fills the air? Will you ever bring a better gift for the world than the breathing respect that you carry wherever you go right now? Are you waiting for time to show you some better thoughts? When you turn around, starting here, lift this new glimpse that you found. Carry into evening all that you want from this day. This interval you spent reading or hearing this, keep it for life. What can anyone give you greater than now, starting here, right in this room, when you turn around? So, um, <laughs> I remember I was teaching, uh, I can't remember how I got, in, got myself into this problem, but I was teaching at a financial institution retreat, and... Uh, and somebody said, well, now you've got to give them all the takeaways <laughs> and uh, tell them. And I said, I don't have any takeaways. <laughs> I have this, this. The universe is in a teacup. That's what I have. <laughs> and you can't really, uh, you can't really not be here and then make up something and then take it away, right? Because 
you can't take away not hereness really, and all you can take away is being here wherever you are when you go. So I mean, no, it doesn't seem that it doesn't seem like that hard, right? You know, and uh, so I don't know. I thought I might ask you to consider what what has surprised you and taken away your plans and thoughts and hopes and competition and how you're really better at something than somebody said you were, <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> that performance was pretty good, actually. Whatever it is, that, what, what has surprised you? What has stolen your, the way you see things? Maybe I'll ask people later uh, about that, but consider the matter, is what I say. <laughs> and it's always like that thing about uh, Stafford has, is one of the notable things of, of Zen, you know, about how it's here. It's what's here, it's the light on the floor. He has a wonderful thing if you're really depressed, but maybe there was an interesting bubble in your soup at lunchtime. <laughs> a friend has treated you bad, but you know the sunlight is creeping across across the floor. And uh, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, there's a famous koan call where somebody says, should I turn towards it or not? And the uh, teacher says, ordinary mind is the way. What is the way? Ordinary mind is the way. Um, I really actually, usually when I hear that, I think it's horseshit. I think people are saying, <laughs> you, know, you know what I think about this stuff. <laughs> I think people are saying, you know, I'm really not trying very hard and I'm not going to try very hard and I'm not going to pay much attention, but I've got it, you know, and uh, I think that's horseshit. <laughs> so, <laughs> however, uh, ordinary mind really is, it's thus, this, this, but then it's not ordinary, of course, when the, the brightness of the grey light, the intensity with which someone dies, you know, all that, you know, are just here. So just to bear that in mind, it's nothing compared to the universe is in a teacup. <laughs> The universe is in a teacup right now. What surprises you, you know? Uh, and you can tell that there's a tremendous comfort seeking thing we have, which is kind of nice. Like I, you know, have a, like I, I like, I, I wake up in the middle of the night, which is an old bad habit. And then I like, and winter, what I like about winter is the house is really dark and I walk out the living room and I've kept a fire going and it's sort of just the fire is, you know, and the whole of the universe, the whole of the meaning of life is in that firelight, you know. But even if I let the fire go out, it's there too, you know. It's in just the beauty of being alive, what, how great it is to be alive. So right now we're all alive. So what's it like? When I say feeling the time, that's what I mean. What's, what's it like for you right now? Not for anyone else, for you right now to be alive. Something you don't have to teach anyone else because they'll find out for themselves or, or not. And probably be terrible at learning from you because <clears throat> I don't know we just are terrible at learning from other people. <laughs> that resistance comes up, garlic and crosses. You know, try to teach your kids something. You know, <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, but you know it's a beautiful thing if you're just in it. If we're just in it, the people around us will gradually be able to feel it and notice it. But we have to have the courage to show up for ourselves. Um, I think I want to read, yeah, I think I want to read the, this other poem. I just, I, I have no memory of writing this poem, which I kind of like when that happens because and it just popped out of my computer and it was a couple, it was a couple of different, it was kind of incoherent. And I showed it to Alison, she said, oh, it's two poems, just cut it in half. That's why it's incoherent. I thought, 
I don't know, I think the incoherence is native, actually. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the universe is in the incoherence. Sea fog. The blue falls out of the chilly air. The onshore wind rises, rattling the halyards. It's hard to forget, or is it hard to remember? But forgetting is the model for keeping on and for keeping on and finding the place where I meet my life. It's hard to forget, or is it hard to remember? But forgetting is the model for keeping on and finding the place where I meet my life. The pelican wheels and falls out of the sky. At this time, I am carried along in my small boat in the fog, peering ahead to see channel markers, hearing bells, and the sweet, harsh barking of the seals that have climbed up onto the buoys. They lift up their heads and shoulders to get comfortable, bark, and flop down again. So there we are. That's the report from my hard drive. But I'm... <laughs> But you can tell there's an eternal thing for whatever you're doing, even being in a small boat in the fog, you know, anything, anything you're doing. Sitting in a temple together, looking at these beautiful faces. You can tell if you don't have a view of things, the faces are actually beautiful. Tess, um... Do you have anything you want to say? I really like that refrain, surprise unmakes the world. Um, the way I was sitting with it is just whatever I think the world is, and particularly I was noticing whatever I think other people might be, or what I think their responses might be or whatever, like all of a sudden when that gets blown open. Um, I don't know, I like, I like that. And uh, y yesterday, the, the surprise in my world was that um, many of know, you know, my father-in-law has been sick and he, we learned yesterday morning that he passed away, which is one of those strange like it's not a surprise because you know it's coming but it's a surprise anyway because whatever is you know whatever the feeling is just appears inside of you and um a couple of really interesting things happened you read the uh well the first one was <laughs> he lives um in a relatively small town and his current wife and his ex-wife who's my partner's mother had this very long-term contentious relationship polite but contentious and um his current wife the first person that she called was the ex-wife because she just didn't know what to do and there was no burial plot no decisions no anything and um when they were sorting all that out the current wife said to the ex-wife would you like me to get three plots so that you know <laughs> My mother-in-law, who's, you know, very dignified under the, just said, you know, I'm thinking of cremation, so thank you very much. But it was, it, it opened something that all of it hadn't been there for many years. And then um, it was funny, you read the fish poem, because as they were getting his obituary together, there was a story that was in there that I had never heard before, which was this, this man was, you know, loving, but very aloof. And, um, the story in the obituary he really loved to fish was that every time he would catch a fish, he would kiss it and give it advice about how not to get <laughs> hooked next time. And then he would throw it back. <laughs> and yet he fished constantly. So this was like a, you know, this was an ongoing, but it, in both those instances and in so many other things that happened yesterday, it was like new dimensions of people's character was either revealed or somehow came into being in response. And that felt like a lot of unmaking and widening of the world. So I think that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you. Alison, do you, do you have anything to say? <laughs> Well, when you read Elizabeth Bishop's The Fish today, um, all the times I've heard it before, 
I've been the woman in the boat, looking and triumphant. And this time, when you read it, uh, suddenly to my surprise, I was the fish. And I so much um, could feel, you know, bits of my body with, you know, old hooks and pieces of metal in it now. And, you know, bits of me sort of tearing off and my eyes getting glazed. And and um, that was so kind of wonderful to be the fish instead. And I've... Um, a couple days ago, I woke up in the morning and my hearing was, I had lost the hearing in my right ear. Like kind of like when you go swimming, you get water in your ear where suddenly it's, everything is sort of muted. And it was part of the, you know, being, being the old fish. And so my mind, which tends to do this, it um, just, it takes... Uh, some circumstance and just it gets as afraid as it possibly can like catastrophizes to the extreme where this hearing loss will lead to sudden and, and death you know within this is probably my last day on earth or I've got to call you know head to the ER or make sure my will's in in written and um so in my mind I'm going through all of this all of this turmoil and then I'm walking around the house and suddenly at the corner of my eye, through a window, I see our bird bath, which is just this basin of, um, it's a handmade bird bath of, of clay. And it's about, I don't know, maybe two and a half feet across. And in it is a, um, a red shouldered hawk, which is, you know, immense and just barely fits in the bird bath. And suddenly the whole world of um, my imminent demise is, is just vanished. And that whole world of fear was unmade in uh, the vision of the, the hawk in the bird bath, the teacup in the garden <laughs> with a hawk in it. That's it. We have it we have a dedication that goes, the hawks cry out again and again, in this world we will not be alone. That we say at the end of retreat. <laughs> so, <laughs> the big bird trying to fit into a bird bath. John and Joseph, do you have anything you want to say? Mm -mm. Um, I've been sitting with the um, the surprising warmth of um, uh, the universe in in my teacup, and that surprising you know just that surprising warmth of being. It's just a lovely poem, and uh, and I was thinking about surprising warmth and and how um, I went to sign up for this session last night and I clicked on the website and there's this like unctuously cute picture of a raccoon hugging a a dog and it was like 10 on the on the cute scale and um and thinking of that surprisingly more <laughs> surprisingly cute picture and it made me think about my dog my own dog she'll she sits outside the uh, the back door um, glass back door night after night, waiting for the raccoons who once in a while come and um, get food from her bowl. And uh, and she's got that. She thinks she's like guarding the world against the raccoons, but but um, she never wakes up and she never sees them. And yet she's got this surprisingly warm and intimate relationship with them and uh yeah that's it and, um, jesse um, uh i'm really surprised by my recent obsession with pickleball um so i'd always thought of myself as somebody who didn't really like sports like i'm a theater music meditation nerd and um 
now I've rearranged my entire schedule three days a week so that I can go and have three hours to play pickleball. And um, it's, it's an interesting thing how much that's connected to like how I think, how I thought I was not like my parents. My parents are both tennis players, like diehard tennis players and now pickleball players because they can't move around quite as much. But, and um, it's uh, all sort of feeds into this this thing about, oh, it turns out that I am like my parents in a lot of ways and how okay, I'm surprised by how okay that is with me. Because once when I get inside of, of that similarity, there's just okayness there. It's just a nice thing to kind of get inside of the shadow and then the shadow starts to dissipate and there's just life there. Um, and then also surprised by the ways that I'm not like them. I'm dramatically different from either of them. So I don't know. I'm just I'm inside that right now. I'm really appreciating it and, and surprised that I'm actually not bad at pickleball. So <laughs> who knew? Um, a friend of mine is on um, Tracy Godet. Do you have anything you want to say? Oh, I was just making a note, John. Hi, everyone. Um, when you first introduced the idea, John, I I found myself reflecting on what is our relationship to surprise, right? Like, do we do we have the desire to be desire, to to be surprised, or do we dread the thought of being surprised? And then in this meditation, the last one, I thought. How do we greet the unmaking of our world? You know? And for some reason, it made me think of Peter Lewis, who's an old friend that John knew as well. And Peter wrote a book he entitled, How I, How I Learned What I Think I Know. <laughs> and what I loved about Peter is, I feel like he, he was always anticipating the joy of being surprised and having it all turned upside down. And and I think that's a fabulous trait. Those are some of my reflections, thanks. Thank you, that's great. Yeah, yeah, how do we, I remember um, I was visiting you when he walked in one time in yeah. North Carolina, in Durham, and, uh, and he just walked in and uh, Ryan, your son was on the floor, and he immediately got on the floor and starts playing with the kid. He he nods to me and gets on the floor and starts playing with the kid. So I thought that was a surprise for me and a pleasant surprise. Yeah, yeah. Not all CEOs do that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, thank you. Uh, John, do you have, also a friend of mine, do you have, uh, Tracy's husband, do you have anything that you want to say about surprise? Yeah, John, I... Um... It's it's interesting. Yesterday we were listening to this um, recording of an Eckhart Tolle book, and one of the the point he was making in this chapter was that uh, a French philosopher that said, "I think, therefore I am," was just terribly wrong. And we're not what we think, and we're not what we think we are. And and so I was probably doing all the wrong things and thinking about that, <laughs> um, but. Um, the other surprise for me in, in uh, our time together today is the uh, the music and my gratitude to the musicians live or recorded who, who provided that. Yeah, um, live. We I, only ever have live. <laughs> well, that, that, we're, we're for live. <laughs> that helps me. That enables my not thinking. Right. It's just being present without the mind being engaged and and I'm fortunate I think in in some ways because when I get in that uh, place where I'm not thinking anymore for reasons I've never been able to explain I see colors I just so I'm in this three-dimensional kind of field of colors and I don't think about anything I just kind of marvel at them and so those things were uh, both surprises to me how um, I think as he expressed it, you know, Eckhart, Eckhart Tolle has it right. And then the second is the degree to which that kind of music facilitates my not thinking. 
surprise and makes the world. The whole universe. As in, as in a teacup. <laughs> That's you and me and everyone in the temple. The great hawk trying to bathe in the little bird bath, doing its best. <laughs> I don't know, we're here. That's enough. <laughs> it's going to have to be enough, isn't it? We're here and how beautiful. Um,